My name is Dane Wigington with the website geoengineeringwatch.org. This is not a job I wanted. I don't have any political orientation. I've never been an activist of any sort. But quite simply, as this issue came to my attention, I have a background in renewable energy with Bechtel Power. And as this issue came to my attention from losing significant amounts of, of solar uptake from whatever these aircraft were putting above my home, I had no choice but to investigate, and I was astounded at what I found. I didn't like what I found, started to test my rainwater, found there was an incredible amount of toxic metals in that water. Those metals matched geoengineering patents, and those amounts have escalated over the course of five years, in the case of aluminum, as much as 50,000% in a single rain event. We're talking about highly toxic rain. How, how many people here believe this is happening? Anybody believe it's not happening? Don't be shy. Nothing wrong with skepticism. Well, I'm well, good. I'm going to hopefully answer your question for the evening, and I'm glad you came. I'm going to dive right into my presentation here, and this presentation is more tailored to what's affecting us right here, right now, in Northern California. Of course, if the ship sinks, the whole ship sinks, so things that are happening around the globe affect us as well. But we have some very straightforward elements that are affecting us here. Congressional research, geoengineering, governance, and technology. When we have local media or media around the globe trying to marginalize this issue using terms specifically for that purpose, I got a call from the searchlight a few days ago, specifically asked them repeatedly, please don't use terms we don't use. We don't use the chemtrails term. It's not science. What's the only term they use, typically? So you have uh, a, a media system whose job it is to marginalize an issue this dire. So when we use terms like geoengineering, this is important when you share this issue with others. When you use the science terms, people find science. The issue has credibility. So the, the semantics are important, geoengineering and climate engineering. That's a 40-page global government's document to the US Congress from a year ago. Now, does that look like a natural trail, like something took a slice out of the middle of it? Again, there's no question they're spraying. We have film footage of them spraying. Now, as this, as this particular footage rolls here, we, we put three on at once. You can see disbursement from a wing on the top right. If you look at the lower film, you can see there's two aircraft there spraying. One shuts off. Watch that film closely. You see the one trail stopped. There's still an aircraft in the plume there. It's hard to see on, on this footage, but you'll watch that come on again. There's, that's a C-17 Globemaster. Up on the top left, you have a KC-10 military tanker. You'll see him shut off that trail completely. And again, we have photographs of wing disbursement. Now, you watch this lower level here. There's a second aircraft there, and you'll see him turn on in a second. He's actually out of the frame. Or oh, I think we've already passed. Yeah, we've already passed that frame. He'll turn back on in a minute. We just put this one together today, so it's, it's rolling twice. But the bottom line is this. We have film footage of them spraying. There's no question they're spraying. So when people try to debate this issue, uh, you can't really debate it. I mean, we, we, have, we have a lot more film footage than what we're showing here. Stratospheric wells box seeding for reduction of global warming. We have 150 patents. Why would they make patents if there wasn't something going on? Why would patents go all the way back to 19, the late 40s? We have a long list of patents, again, about 150. And the exact ingredients we see in these patents, this one was assigned to Hughes Aircraft in 1991, oxides of metal. Why do they use metal? Why do they use aluminum? Because aluminum reflects. And that's, that's the stated purpose of these programs, solar radiation management, to reflect the sun. The rub is they're destroying Earth's natural protection by doing this. How much sense does that make? So uh, again, we have patents assigned to DOD, Department of Defense, Hughes Aircraft, listing the exact materials that are raining down on us in absolutely lethal amounts. It's not coming from China. We have from CARB, California Air Resources Board, studies on the, metals, uh, the aerosols coming from China. Aluminum is not amongst those metals because aluminum can't float across oceans. Mercury can because mercury converts to a gaseous state, but not aluminum. So we have enough aluminum coming down on us now to change forest floor pHs. That takes a lot of metal. Updated, uh, this is engineered drought catastrophe, target California. Now, in the case of California, one, we have a shredded ozone layer, northern and southern hemispheres now. The power structure is trying desperately to hide that from us. We can see our trees around town here. They're burnt to a crisp. 
So, and we had a recent disclosure I'll talk about in a minute from NASA. But we also have a very straightforward equation. We know from available science that when you aerosolize the atmosphere, it diminishes and disperses rainfall. This is not about cloud seeding to create rain. Again, it's about creating artificial, toxic cloud cover. So we have satellite imagery, which I'll show in a moment. And, and this is what blocks our storm track. This is what's keeping the rain from falling in California. If you see off the US West Coast, if you look closely near the bottom center, you can see the aircraft trailing. I don't know how visible it is to all of you, but that entire marine layer is aerosols. And all that blows in on us. And what happens when they aerosolize in the atmosphere? Again, it shreds ozone, and it diminishes and disperses rain. It reduces evaporation. This is a t as far as the rainfall in California, it's a 2 plus 2 equals 4 equation. Now, I presented this data to, to Gavin Newsom in the Capitol two months ago in his office with his aide. There's no question they got what I passed on to them, but apparently they're too comfortable in their job still to actually do anything about this issue. And until the population is unwilling to look the other way, they'll continue to do nothing. Another picture, how obvious is that spraying? Why don't meteorologists talk about this? Because it's a bad career decision. It's a bad career decision, so they simply want to stay in their job. I've been in the field with USDA soil scientists measuring soil pHs in Shasta County with a solid USDA baseline, getting measurements 15 to 20 times above that baseline. And they looked at me sheepishly and said, what do you want us to do about it? They want to go to work at 8 and come home at 5, and that's simply not OK. It's not OK to overlook this issue. The gravity of it is, is far too immense. Another picture, you see virtual grid patterns. Are we supposed to believe that's commercial traffic doing loops in one case and grid patterns in another? It's absolutely not commercial traffic. And if you look at the scope and scale of what they can cover, those are 100% aerosol clouds over the Pacific. That's one of their goals, to block the sun over the oceans, to keep the thermal buildup, the heat, from building up in the oceans. But again, the paradox is what they're doing is actually making the overall situation worse because it traps more heat than it deflects, shreds the ozone layer, disrupts the hydrological cycle. This is the pharmaceutical cure for planet Earth that has a, a lift of side effects so long that it, it makes the original problem look benign. Yet another, this one's a little blurry, but you still see the trailing off the coast. Again, same thing. This is typical every day. You, when we see these silvery white skies toward the horizon in the morning in, in the east, in the afternoon in the west, skies should be blue, not silvery white. And the bottom line is even when you don't see the horizon to horizon trails, we are absolutely still being sprayed. When you see even the shorter, bright trails, still aerosol disbursement. I challenge anybody, look at the high bypass turbofan jet engine, which is all tankers and all commercial carriers. 80% of the air that passes through that engine is non-combusted. That engine by design is almost incapable of making any type of trail. So when you see the silvery white skies still being sprayed, the horizon to horizon trails are the tip of the iceberg for these programs. Now, this is a, this is a very important map. This shows deviation from normal temperatures. This is a, a NASA map. And if you look, the only place that's colder than the 30-year norm is the a few spots in Antarctica and the eastern half of North America. Why is that? Because that's why they're really focusing the climate engineering. That's where they're really concentrating. Why? Because that confuses a lot of people. That makes leaders around the globe think, hey, maybe geoengineering works. Y you can cool one place at the cost of making the rest of the planet warmer. So when we see a map like this that's so incredibly anomalous, it, it makes very clear, again, where we see a geoengineering effort being concentrated, the polar vortex, which I'm sure you've all heard of, that keeps happening again and again, and it's going to happen this week again, a polar vortex in the middle of summer. The climate's being completely manipulated from bottom to top. Another important map, again, this is deviation from normal temperatures. You see most of the globe is in the darker colors, which is warmer than normal. And I know this confuses a lot of people because they see a lot of headlines to the contrary. If you're a geoengineer and you're trying to sell geoengineering, you want people to think it works. And that's why there's a lot of push in the media toward this. What we need to understand, if they try to sell us geoengineering as a cure, it is not a cure. It is a curse. It is not making the planet cooler. It is making a bad situation worse. But again, you see eastern half of North America, a couple other spots where they're geoengineering heavily over populations. That's it. Now, 
These are NOAA maps. I save these maps because they're, they're impossible to find uh, after the fact because I don't think they want people looking at this. Does that look natural to anybody? To have half of the country frying and the other half freezing? Now this is going back to October 2013. This is as unnatural meteorologically as you could get. How can this happen? Because this is geoengineering. This is what happens when you upset the natural system. So when you see those colors, the oranges and reds, every tier of color is an indication of two to three degrees above normal. So as you progress into the darker colors, you might be 10, 15 degrees above normal. Opposite is true on the other side. So you have half the country frying, half of it freezing. That's October 2013. This is HARP. For those that don't know what HARP is, it's an ionosphere heater. That's part of these programs. So as they spray these particulates, it makes the atmosphere more conductive, more electrically conductive. These are incredibly huge and powerful ground-based facilities that they use to manipulate these particulates. So when you have the polarization of these particulates that's sensitive to radio frequency, they can cause those particulates to scatter out and cover the sky, or they can cause them to attract and come together and form big enough condensation nuclei to cause rain. Again, playing God with the weather with extremely toxic materials. That facility can put out about 3 billion watts of power, billion with a B. Uh, it's capable of heating the ionosphere to 15,000 degrees Fahrenheit over areas hundreds of square miles. What they're doing to our climate system is beyond science fiction, but it's fact. This looks like something from a science fiction movie. That's the same type of facility on a mobile platform. It's called SBX radar, sea-based X-band radar, for the same purpose, manipulating the climate system. Again, the polar vortex, does that look natural to you? These giant dips that are only coming down over North America. Last winter, we had temperatures in the lower 48 that were colder than the North Pole. Why is that? Because they're robbing Peter to pay Paul. They push cold air south. They nucleate that moisture with chemical ice nucleation to cool it off, to create headlines, to make it appear geoengineering is working. It's not working. This is the polar vortex from this week. Now, I ask anybody, if anybody that knows anything about meteorology, that's unprecedented. To have a giant teardrop of cold air in one part of the country while the rest of the country fries, while Siberia fries, th this is simply, um, it's like a bunch of kids in a sandbox with unimaginably powerful toys that are just experimenting with the atmosphere, literally. Uh, another GISS map. Again, you see where it's cold over North America and Canada and actually warmer in the Arctic than it is here. Headlines don't cover this. While the eastern U.S. was freezing last year, Alaska had its warmest January on record. Nobody talked about that. Again, polar vortex, manipulation of the jet stream. You see the Pacific air cut off. Why is that? Because with, with these giant ionosphere heaters and the aerosolized skies, they can heat an area or they can cool an area. And as they heat over California, it causes an even stronger high pressure. That spins the jet stream clockwise. That allows them to push that up through, air, up through Alaska, causing the warmest January on record. They pump the air back south. And that's what enabled them to create these parade of winter snowstorms we saw last year. So if everybody remembers, 2012 was the warmest year ever recorded in the continental US. 50,000 high temperature record set. How could it switch so radically in one year? Geoengineering. They had a point to prove, and they're trying to prove it. Again, GISS maps, you see the warm temperatures over the Arctic and the darker colors. Where is it cold? Continental US. The lower 48 is 1.5% is of Earth's surface area. 1.5%, that's not much. And that's what they're focusing on cooling, because that's where it makes the biggest impression. Again, rainfall. I want to make this point. As I showed you the maps before, where the west was frying and the east was cold, the A indicates different tiers of above normal rainfall. The darker color, the more excessive rain you get. The opposite is true along the whole west coast. Does that look natural? If moisture moves from west to east, how does it get to the east without crossing over the west, without dropping anything? Because they aerosolize our rain. As it's coming in from the Pacific, and they seed those clouds, and they cause a disbursement of that rain, it migrates it somewhere else. So at this point, they're virtually cutting off our rain. When you see all that spray off the coast, that's part of this process. When you see a map like this where one, and especially a, a configuration like that where the moisture has to come across us to get inland, how does that happen without them migrating it there? This is, again, this is astounding to see maps like this where virtually the whole western U.S. is frozen like a line down. Is this a game for them? 
Is it a game? This is a NOAA map going into, well, we're now into January. So as you remember, the polar vortex in the eastern half of the U.S., look what happened in the western half. Nobody talks about that in the Weather Channel, per se. Same thing. This is moving two weeks further out. How does it stay in these positions? Because it's locked into these positions. How many meteorologists have you heard saying, we can't figure out what's keeping this persistent high pressure over the West? We just can't figure it out. Well, you know, when, you, when, when you're not looking at the whole picture, how can you figure it out? So the bottom line is, again, whatever the agenda is here, we can all speculate, whether it's to cut off the water to California, to bring us to our knees, to, to take water rights, whether we're a climate sacrifice zone, it doesn't really make much difference if we turn our spigot on and nothing comes out. Yet another map moving into March, same thing, over and over and over. It's absolutely unprecedented, and, and this is absolutely a result of climate engineering. Again, two weeks later, same thing, same pattern. Meteorologically speaking, this is absolutely unprecedented, where you're 20, 25 degrees below normal on one side, 25 degrees above on the other. Into April, two weeks again, same basic pattern, held in place, locked in place, absolutely uh, frozen due, due to the pattern they've set up over us. Uh, two weeks further on out again, same thing, just trying to make a point. Now we're into July, same thing. This is not a joke. I mean, the, by the time, if this continues, if the lack of moisture over us continues, I think we all know what's coming. So at, at this point, no matter what we do on the ground to try to exercise our rights, if they have that kind of power over us, if they can shut off our water, if they can toxify our air and soils, it's, it's going to be game over if it continues. But the bottom line is these maps are completely unprecedented. You don't see this kind of stuff on CNN. These are NOAA maps, by the way. And by the way, NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, who does their mapping? Raytheon. Raytheon's a defense industry contractor up to their eyeballs in weather modification. So you have the foxes virtually running the hen house. Who does FAA's weather modeling? Lockheed Martin, also a defense contractor, also up to their eyes in weather modification. This is interesting. NOAA, again, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, stating that in the last 10 years, the atmosphere is full of particulates, and they don't know where it's coming from. Now, how, now how astounding is that? How, how, how incredibly total are the blinders when we have this kind of behavior from quote-unquote agencies that are supposed to tell us what's wrong? And why don't the air quality agencies show anything? Because this is what you always hear. This can't be going on because we're not showing anything. An example I use because it's accurate. How the hell do you catch a minnow with a tuna net? You can't do it. How do you find nanoparticulates with air quality systems that only measure PM 2.5 at best? You can't get an air sample that shows these small particulates with equipment that's not designed to do it. So we have our local air quality literally trying to convince us none of this is happening because their equipment is not capable of showing this and they won't do another test. Uh, at least not to date they haven't. Their job seems to be to try to convince us that we should ignore a threat of this magnitude, and that's not acceptable. Alzheimer's and autism, the common link, aluminum exposure. There's a mountain of aluminum coming down on us. It's accumulating in all of us. We have statements from internationally recognized neuroscientists like Dr. Russell Blaylock stating that these particulates enter right through our lung lining, go right into our bloodstream, where they build up in our systems like a plaque. Tomorrow we have a, one of the top neurologists in Northern California speaking about this issue. He's being inundated with patients that are now becoming cognitively dysfunctional, Alzheimer's and autism, or excuse me, al Alzheimer's and dementia. One in three seniors now dies with Alzheimer's and or dementia. Not dies from it, but dies with it. But many are dying from Alzheimer's now. It's, gone, it's going absolutely off the charts. Autism. 10,000% increase in the last 50 years. One in 50 children now dies again, or, or excuse me, now has autism. So that's a, the, the kind of increases we're seeing are absolutely cataclysmic. Prevalence of Alzheimer's disease, that graph's not hard to figure out. It's going through the roof. It can't not go through the roof. There's a direct cause and effect happening here, and we are not speculating about these materials being in the air. We've done 60-plus lab tests in Shasta County alone, the material's there. It's inarguable. 
unprecedented ozone hole opens up over the Canadian Arctic, the kind of headline you don't see, you have to dig for this. Canadian government threatened publicly to fire their scientists if they talked to the media about this ozone hole. How many of you can feel how hot the sun is? It's not your imagination. We started measuring UV because we knew that geoengineering destroys the ozone layer. We know that from science study. We, met, we started measuring a year and a half ago. We meticulously documented our measurements. We released it about a year ago. Our website was taken down in 15 minutes, was taken down eight times in the next two days. And we had a lot of flack from uh, academicians, meteorologists that said, this is impossible. You're wrong. So now a week ago, we have NASA releasing their headlines. This is one of them, CBS News from a week ago. Blazing world record strongest UV rays ever measured on Earth. Why were we so far ahead of them? How can a system be designed in a manner that virtually does everything possible to hide this kind of data? And how high were these UV ratings? They weren't 10 or 20 or 30% higher, they were 300% higher than what's already considered extreme. That's about like walking out and, and being told that tomorrow it's going to be 400 degrees outside. That's about the equivalent. They measured UV. If any of you are familiar with the UV scale, 11 or 12 is considered very extreme. Caution should be taken. NASA measured in 2003 UV levels of 43. 43, equivalent to the surface of Mars, literally. Why did it take 11 years for them to release that data? And how much worse is it now? And why aren't they telling us? Because they don't want to cause a panic, and they certainly don't want any light being shown on the geoengineering that's causing the destruction of the ozone layer. CFCs that we've been told are the cause are a factor, but they're a very small factor mathematically compared to the climate engineering. This is what our trees look like around Redding. Take a good look, because they look worse every day. It takes a lot of UV to burn the bark right off the side of the tree. And anybody who tells you this is normal, it's not normal. These UV levels have been high for decades. They're getting higher every single day. So although you saw some bark scorch 30 years ago, it got much worse and much worse. And now you can hardly grow a tree in places. It's so bad. So this is not normal. This is not natural. Same thing. This is, in the parking lots around Reading, you see this everywhere. People should consider how much UV it takes to do that. This is the planet we're heading for, no question about that. And again, no matter what news you see and from what source, consider a headline is not a fact. You have to consider who put that headline out, and you have to consider what their motive might be. And never, ever ignore your own sense of reason. If someone tells you the planet's getting colder, and I don't like Al Gore, I want to make that clear. I'm not an Al Gore fan or any, any of those types of people or carbon credits or any of that. It's not about that. It's about reality. When you walk outside and you feel how intense that heat is, and you, you know that they are trying to hide the fact that they've done damage to the atmosphere, just like the Gulf of Mexico. I don't know how many of you know that they used a chemical called Corexit in the Gulf of, Gulf of Mexico, and that's about the most uh, idiotic term for what the, the chemical does. It doesn't correct anything. The, by, all, by the environmental impact reviews done in the Gulf of Mexico, that chemical made the situation 52 times more toxic. It's banned around the globe, so why did they use it? To hide the problem. Same mentality is going on here. Uh, it's, it's making our situation exponentially worse. Now, this is where it starts to get really interesting. This headline's a day old. How does NOAA know that even though we have an El Nino that's building that should bring rain to California, how do they know that we shouldn't count on El Nino to bring us rain? How do they know that? Are we not scheduled to get any rain? Because at this point, it's not forecasting, it's scheduling. And this is Raytheon giving us this headline, not NOAA. How can they possibly know that we're not going to get any rain out of an El Nino? Because they can migrate this moisture across us as long as they want. And how secure can any of our futures be when we don't control what should be natural, when we don't control the weather? They control how much falls on us, how much not, how toxic it is, what other chemicals there may be in it. We're getting aluminum, barium, strontium, copper, manganese, and all these metals are toxic in and of themselves. But you start to mix these metals, and now you have a very lethal mix. You have something called synergistic toxicity. In the case of aluminum and mercury, we all have mercury in us. We know that. We all have aluminum in us now. We know that. There'll be some testing data presented tomorrow. Every human subject tested, whether it's hair, urine, or blood, is showing massive amounts of these metals. 
In the case of aluminum and mercury, when you mix these two metals with synergistic toxicity, you can increase that toxicity by 10,000%. So when you consider how lethal we know each of these metals are, and you bump that up to that degree, it's a bad mix. Again, when someone tries to tell you this is normal, they need to seriously check their reality. Nothing normal about this. And, and again, when we know that a high bypass turbofan jet engine, I encourage anybody to go to geoengineeringwatch.org, look at the tutorial we have halfway down the middle of the page. It's a 20 minute tutorial that will explain that a high bypass turbofan jet engine is almost incapable of producing a quote condensation trail. And again, we know it's not condensation. We have film footage of them being turned on and off at altitude, not natural. This is, this is our website. The sole purpose of this website is to get the word out to simply get the word out to everyone who's willing to prioritize the battles we face. There's a lot of challenges coming at us. I know that. I focus myself on this issue because quite simply, this is the hole in the bottom of the ship. If we can't stop the climate engineering, nothing else will matter. Nothing else will matter. This is tearing apart Earth's life support systems. Think of the, the level of human insanity it takes to think that you could play God with the weather without killing everything. That's what we're up against. We're not politically oriented. We don't sell anything. In fact, we give it away. I try to give everything away I possibly can because I simply want the word out because my children have no future if this continues. And the, and the immediacy of our situation can't be overstated. This is not a linear equation. You'd, you have certain elements of academia. In fact, the largest scientific panel ever created in human history on any subject is the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They don't have any feedback loops built, built into their modeling, which means their modeling is virtually worthless. So the science they're trying to feed you is virtually worthless that makes you think that something bad might happen in 50 years or 100 years. We're not on that kind of time frame. Our, our climate system is disintegrating right now, and geoengineering is the largest single factor fueling that fire. And with the military-industrial complex mentality, the worse a problem gets, the more you just do the same thing to try to cover it up. And that doesn't work. And we have a lot of good people in the military, wonderful people. In fact, today, I was in the recruiting offices for the Marines, the Air Force, and the Army. Great people, great people there, very respectful, very honorable men and women. And they are very receptive when I pass them on data and simply explain that there's a lot of academicians, a lot of scientists that are simply very, very misguided. And we're trying to get the word out so that the military knows that the advice they're being given is absolutely lethal. And we will all go down with the ship if, if those in power continue to follow that advice. So we need the support of our military brothers and sisters. We're all in this together. I want to do Q&A now, but I'm very grateful for everybody that's, that's come tonight. Everybody, tomorrow morning, the meeting is extremely important in Shasta County. Uh, there's a movie, by the way, uh, Terry mentioned to me, called America, that's playing right now at Movies 14. Apparently, they show the spraying in that movie. A lot of you have seen that, perhaps. It's not mentioned, but it's going to be mentioned soon in a lot of arenas. I, I was contacted by Oliver Stone's son, who's a director, to address this issue soon. There's a lot of people in, that, are of, that have the ability to get the word out that are now involved. So anyway, the film America, I think, is a good one to see. But I hope as many of you as possible can show up tomorrow. Because we have, we've had a county air quality division that has done their absolute best to hide this, to marginalize it. There's no question about that. In 2008, when I tried to bring this issue before the board, and Russ Mull lied about the cost of testing, he simply lied, there's no other word for it, when he said testing would cost a million dollars for an aluminum test that cost $20. And they, and, and they cut off the speaking after this, so this is the kind of thing we face. We went into air quality, about six of us, to try to get them to come to at least talk to us about this issue. He wouldn't even come to the front desk after not answering emails for a week. It's not like we weren't trying to reach him. A virtual stonewalling. I'm grateful to those supervisors that helped put this on the agenda for tomorrow, but from the county employees at Air Quality, 
We have been virtually stonewalled on this issue, even though we have absolute indisputable proof of this contamination. So back to tomorrow, extremely important meeting and why it matters so much is because if we could put this on the radar in Shasta County, it would make a, a, a shockwave around the globe because if once we have an agency that cannot deny that the public will not accept that denial, they must admit this contamination wherever they think it's coming from, it's there. It's a public health hazard and it must be disclosed. UV, very, very, very dangerous UV levels, period. The, the amounts of skin cancer and optical problems are going to be off the charts because UVB is horrifically harmful. And what we're seeing is UVB levels that are 1,200% higher than we're being told. That's astronomically high. So it is their mandated duty to disclose this to the public. If we could get it disclosed by enough public support, it would indeed be covered around the globe. We have a journalist that's coming in from Spain tomorrow to cover this. I think she might be in here right now. Josefina, I see you out there. There we go. Uh, thank you. Thank you for coming. She's done much for this cause, and I, my deepest gratitude for her for showing up. But it's all of us together that matters in unison to make our voice heard now because we don't have tomorrow. We don't have the time to spare in this battle. This issue, above all others, must be won. It's a uniting issue. It brings everybody together. So my deepest gratitude for all of you. I hope you, you, you will join us tomorrow in this most important meeting. And thank you very much for coming. I'll try to answer your questions now. <laughs>